How's it going, everybody? This is Brian Alvarez on Wrestling Observer Live, and I am back here after an entire month. And today is a good day for me to return because we have no idea where Dave is. He is missing in action. And so the show is going to begin without him, and hopefully he will come running upstairs any time now, huffing and puffing to uh, continue the show. But if uh, by chance he's uh, not here, perhaps he's doing some acting gig, we will have Mike Tanay on soon. Uh, Talk about TNA, because there's a lot of uh, TNA news to talk about, and a lot of news in general, because we haven't had a show in two weeks, and in the last two weeks, obviously, a lot of stuff has gone on. And probably in the last month, too, but uh, I have no idea what's been talked about on the show in the last month, but I can make a pretty good assumption. Last weekend was uh, Survivor Series, which was an okay show. Uh, first two matches were good, main event was good, the undercard was, uh, I guess the medium, then both the card was uh, left a lot to be desired. Heidenreich and Undertaker, uh, of note, went... I would say about five times as long as I expected it to go, and it was uh, better than I expected, but still hard. And uh, John Heidenreich still has a job. Unlike 12 other individuals who uh, have been cut from WWE, I actually don't have a list in front of me, but most of you probably know all their names by now. No real surprises, with, ex- with the exception of uh, Rico, who was in the middle of a program and uh, was pretty good. I assume they just figured he was uh, old and uh, got rid of him, which was kind of uh, his downfall from day one. They thought he was too old. And uh, Gail Kim is gone as well, which was also a surprise because she had been on Raw the Monday before. And uh, apparently Rico also had a column, a fake column in WWE Magazine that just came out uh, this week or something. So uh, I assume a lot of these cuts uh, were just kind of made on the fly. Uh, Vince perhaps didn't even know some of these people were still employed and canned them. So uh, that's latest on that. The good guys got control with the Survivor Series win. So we have uh, Raw is Benoit, Raw is Orton, and Raw is Jericho still upcoming. And we had uh, Raw is Maven this past Monday night. Uh, the gist of the show uh, ended up being that Hunter is now the top babyface and the top heel on Raw all at the same time as he overcome he overcame all the odds in a Steve Austin or Rock-like performance in uh, beating Maven and also outsmarting Chris Jericho and Chris Benoit, who are supposed to be the top baby faces, all in one uh, evening, all in one match to uh, retain his title. And uh, Maven, as Hunter promised, will probably be jerking the curtain soon. And uh, we've also got uh, some pay-per-views coming up from WWE and TNA. Uh, for WWE, it's going to be Bradshaw versus Eddie versus Undertaker versus Booker T in a four-way for the title next month. And for Team A in December, it's Randy Savage, AJ Styles, and Jeff Hardy versus Jeff Beard, Scott Hall, and Kevin Nash, and some other matches as well. We have Mike Tene from NWA TNA here as well. Is that correct, Mike? Dave and Brian, how you guys doing tonight? Hey, hey, we're doing good. Brian, I haven't talked to you in like I've returned. I know I haven't talked to you. It seems like it's a good day too because you were missing. I know, really, no kidding. But anyway, Brian, how have you been? Uh, everything's going pretty good. So that's good. That's good, Mike. And how are you doing? Doing great. Believe it or not, it snowed in Las Vegas today. Wow. That is unusual. And I'm headed out to Orlando where it's 84 tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> For another taping. You know, Mike, um, you know, we talked about it uh, before the week, but this, this was the uh, most important uh, one-week period, not this past week, but the week before in history of the company. And uh, what's, you know, what's your tally of the week? Yeah, I think without question, when you, when you factor in that we had... Uh, the, the pay-per-view event, the Victory Road event, as well as the two, uh, Best Damn Sports Show wrestling specials. I don't think there was any question that, that, uh, it was the most important week so far in the history of, of the company. And I, I think as we come out of it, of course it's, it's tough without having any of the official numbers on the buy rates, but it seems to me as far as the pay-per-view goes, from what I've heard, both in, in terms of the response, Dave, that you got, as well as some of the early numbers that, uh, that we were able to get, it looks pretty encouraging as far as the pay-per-view goes in terms of uh, buy rate numbers. Uh, I think as, as far as the Best Damn Sports Show reports are concerned, I think I expected more. I, I think that as a company, we probably put our best foot forward. I, I think looking back on it, and I, I certainly was involved probably, you know, for hours and hours of involvement that I had both in, in, in doing the show and, and, you know, reviewing it later. I really can't second guess TNA in any way, shape, or form in terms of the product that we put out there. But I think I was a little disappointed in, in terms of the way the rating numbers came back. Uh, I was I was projecting them higher. I mean, I, I guess in terms of the best damn sports show, in some instances we doubled the numbers that they had. But uh, I still thought probably that uh, that the ratings would be a little bit higher. Yeah. The um, you know, going through what what is your thought as far as the state of 
the industry as a whole as we speak right now? Because it's kind of an interesting, it's an interesting, unique time. I think that WWE is is going is going down a certain road. I think it's a bad road as far as trying to do too many pay per views, which in a sense is is what your company did as well. And I, but I don't think they're learning from their mistakes. No, I, I don't think so either. I would agree with you. I think that uh, that if, if I were in the WWE shoes, I think I would be regrouping for 2005. And I think I would be looking at uh, going to the single pay-per-views one a month, and I would also be going to a single roster again. And, and, if, and if you didn't want to make that drastic of a change, then there certainly has to be some of the freshening uh, done in terms of the rosters when it comes to Raw and SmackDown because... I mean, the matchups are, are really, with one or two exceptions, just so stale, and we've just seen them over and over again. So I think that uh, drastic changes are, are really required uh, on their part. As far as the state of the industry overall, I think the opportunity certainly is there for TNA to come in now and to be perceived as that alternative product, that, that hipper product to the WWE. I think the chance is there, although I, I think when you, when you look at things overall, we're... We're approaching this probably at the, the worst possible time in terms of just the overall state of the wrestling business. So it probably becomes two or three times as hard, uh, you know, just to try and make those, those inroads on every front, whether it's trying to sell advertising, whether it's trying to sell your product to, to someone at a network, whether it's just trying to get exposure to the wrestling fan. I think it's, it's, it's probably harder than ever right now. Brian, do you have any thoughts on the last couple of weeks and everything going down? I was going to say, going back to uh, the brand extension, I mean, I, I think that one of the biggest benefits to the brand extension should have been that when things get stale, it's really easy to spice things up by having a major name just jump to the other side. And they have never taken advantage of that. And every time someone's jumped ship, it's pretty much been a uh, waste. And the guy's gone to the other side and almost been worse off. Uh, with, with a few exceptions, I think Shelton Benjamin would be the one yeah, exception yeah. that pops to my head. But, but generally speaking, I mean, they certainly tried with Rene Dupree, and it really didn't matter. I don't know the Booker Booker T's Booker T in a sense you could say is stronger because he's on on a, a roster with less depth, but he's really the same, I think. You know that he was on on the other side. And I look at the the Armageddon show in a couple of weeks, and I mean, to me, when, when they announced on Tuesday night, you know, which which was announced SmackDown on Thursday. When they announced that they were doing the four-way with Booker T and um, Eddie Guerrero and um, Bradshaw and Undertaker, to me it was like it was like saying right there that we have no main events left because we have no ideas. We're just going to put all these guys together in a four-way and hope that people will go, well, geez, now you've got um, three baby faces against Bradshaw. He can't possibly win, which, of course, puts Bradshaw in that hunter position where all the odds are against him, and um, it's pretty hard to get heel heat that way, I think. Yep. Yeah, we've, we've seen the way that, uh, that they've booked some of those main events on Raw just in the past month or so that, uh, that it just almost like they're just booked completely backwards from the babyface hill standpoint. You know, I was, I was never a proponent from the start of the split roster, but now that you are dealt that hand, why don't you try and take advantage of that since you have these general managers, uh, with, with Raw and SmackDown and certainly just take a, just take a page out of out of the, the professional sports book in terms of trades and what really gets fans more excited or more interested than in baseball, the hot stove league, uh, all the internet rumors in all the major sports when it comes to possible trades. I mean, this to me is just one of the, the again, another layup that, that they've been given, another silver platter that they've been handed that ever since they've done the split rosters, they're ever really been much in terms of, like, trade talk? I mean, I, I can remember once, maybe, or twice they did angles. Right, and they did the thing in March where they freshened up the mid-card a little bit, but eventually, like, with the exception of the with the and Shelton Benjamin, I don't know that anyone came off really strong on that one um, or in any better of a position than they were before. Speaking of, of handing things on a silver platter, Brian, you know, I haven't talked to you once since the, uh, the Kurt Angle thing with uh, Daniel Pewter a couple weeks ago. Well, I mean, what were your thoughts on, on this now looking back it's been several weeks now. Um, I felt pretty much the same way you did, that it was a, a wasted opportunity. And uh, um, to, to me, it was just, to me, it wasn't so much that particular um, deal, because it's not, I, don't, I don't really think that, that an angle, pewter angle, would turn everything around. Well, no, nothing's going to turn everything around. No. But uh, to me, it was just like, it was one more reminder of how many, how many things they have been given that they've, uh, they've just wasted. 
so many so many great opportunities that they've just let slip through. And I think that like to me, I think Vince is the death of this company, um, no matter uh, which way it goes. If Vince is around till he's 150 years old, uh, this company isn't going to last because he's got this mindset where if he doesn't come up with it, uh, they're not going to do anything with it. And I look at things like how successful the ECW DVD is and how successful the uh, Flair book is and all these things that it's obvious the fans want something to be done with these things, but Vince has no desire to do anything with them. Uh, squashing the idea of war games, squashing everything that he did not create. And uh, that's going to be the death of it because he cannot keep coming up with fresh ideas all the time. And every time business has been down, the only thing that's turned it around is uh, somebody has hit him on the ass with something new and he's had to uh, fight to uh, recreate it or create it or make it his own or whatever. And there's nothing like that coming. And if he does go, if something tragic should happen and he goes tomorrow, uh, the company's in the hands of this man, Hunter, who wants to be the top babyface and the top heel at the same time. And uh, that's death. Yes. Um, anyway, we, all lines, I just want to make mention that all lines are lit up and we will start taking phone calls in just a second. Mike, um, as far as that whole thing goes, you know, in fact, let's let's go. In fact, because we haven't really talked about tough enough at all. You know, Mike, your thoughts. And, and did you see Thursday's tough enough? And, and if you have not, your thoughts on tough enough up to this point? Yeah, I've seen all the tough enough uh, material up until this week, and actually, uh, I was on my I was on the table right up to the point where they introduced the Bashams, and I saw the Bashams coming out. So I have not seen the SmackDown from this week. Uh, I have, uh, I, you know, I've, I've been entertained certainly by. The tough enough segments that have aired so far. Uh, don't, don't, you, don't you think? And I, don't, and I was Brian this too. Don't you think coming off of the Kurt Angle thing that the next week when they used the May Young thing that they absolutely shot themselves right in the temple? Well, especially because now they, they had a a bigger presence with people who would would probably be be interested in anything but that as an angle. Uh, they, they certainly probably had uh, a lot bigger presence in terms of an audience from people on the mixed martial arts boards and people that, that have not watched wrestling in a long time that, that heard about what happened and tuned in. So I think you automatically, t- you just really you turn those people off by insulting their intelligence when you come back with that the following week. But to me, it's, it's the biggest disappointment was recognizing the opportunity that they had. Uh, I mean, when you see Pewter raise his hand, when he puts his hand in the air, when, when Kurt Angle uh, asks if there's anybody else there, uh, I, you know, to see the crowd response, if, if you go back and if you have that on tape, look at, look at the way those people stand as one and get behind him. And, and then when he gets in that ring and, and, and has the camera on, on angle, I, okay, they, they, they didn't recognize it that night. And, and I would give them free pass on that. But to not follow up on it, if following weeks, maybe you take someone like a Taz and you make him the spokesperson and, and Taz, you know, certainly has that kind of credibility where he could bond and connect with the audience and, and he could explain to the people what actually went down. Um, I think the biggest thing is it's not an idea that they hatched internally, so automatically they're going to be very negative towards it. Um, I, I think, however, they will recognize the impact of the sales of the ECW DVDs and probably also because they need to freshen things up. And I would be shocked if they do not go some kind of an ECW spin-off, whether it's an internal group or whether they actually, you know, maybe even come up with their own ECW TV show at this point. Uh, ECW TV show, that would be at a show. They would have to put it on in the velocity time slot or the heat time slot, which actually, and, and let's face it, it couldn't do worse than those shows are doing. Right, I would just put it in that slot. I wouldn't add it to what they have. I would have it replace one of those shows. The only thing is is that what ECW did to BECW, like with a fire and things like that, I don't think you can get away with on television today. No, I still think, though, that they will do some kind of a spinoff with it internally, whether it's just on the SmackDown show or, or on the Raw show. So we're going to start in St. Louis with John. John, how are you tonight? I'm doing fine, Dave, uh, Mike, and uh, Brian there. Um, you know, uh, first off, Dave, I wanted to ask you something. If Has there ever been anything that has occurred close to what occurred um, this weekend uh, in the NBA game? With on our test in, in, in a, rest, a professional wrestling event? Uh, I'm certain it has. In fact, um, I've probably seen it. I've seen it when I was a kid, and, and Mike, I'm sure, can attest to going to matches at the Olympic in Los Angeles, watching heels fight their way through the fans, throwing punches. Um, I mean, it wasn't an everyday thing, and it probably didn't happen as often as a lot of old-timers would like to tell you, but, but I have seen it, and I'm, I'm sure Mike has as well. 
Absolutely. I can remember Fee Blassie in L.A. initially as a heel, then later John Tolis as a heel uh, in riot-like situations. Um, that's funny that you brought that up. I had a conversation this afternoon with Bobby Heenan, where, needless to say, we Bobby's a big NBA fan and, and big hey, Bobby fan. got Bobby got shot at once. I was just, <laughs> you know, we talked about Bobby, you know, from being from Indianapolis, big Indiana Pacers fan, and we were talking about the Pacers uh, Pistons uh, problems the other night, and and Bobby went into detail on. You know, stories that I may have heard once or twice before, but nonetheless very entertaining about all the times, including the time at the International Amphitheater in Chicago, uh, where he was shot at, the times that, that, uh, you know, he got involved with fans in, in, in terms of punching, uh, a fan or trying to fight back. A couple of things that Bobby brought up to me in terms of the wrestling business was, he was always taught never to go out into the crowd because once you once you cross that barrier, you now turn your back on a certain part of the audience, uh, and and you never can can leave yourself exposed with your back to the audience. That's one of the one of the problems. The other thing was, any time that you took a punch at a wrestling fan, uh, in terms of anything legal from that point on, you were pretty much on your own because back in the regional territory days, it wasn't like the local promoter. Uh, was going to stand up for you and, and fight your legal battles once you hit that fan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, because yeah, I, but I mean, but if a fan enters the ring, I, I, I think I've, I, I've uh, seen I've seen that a lot too. Monday Night okay. Raw against and Brian Hildebrand. <laughs> no, that, that's a, that's a famous one. But I mean, I I I, I, I nicknamed the shooter after that night. Yeah, I mean, I grew I grew up and I saw I saw big fans get into the ring and and uh, you know I saw incidents with wrestlers you know more than once. Um, it wasn't. And I'm sure in some parts of the country it was not all that unusual. Um, and I, I've seen I've seen wrestlers go into the crowd. I mean, you know, you've, you've seen a little bit of it all. Um, I was amazed, uh, you know, watching that footage, uh, just because I just thought it was so unprofessional of the basketball players to do that. Right. Um, I mean, not you know. And granted, you know, I, I'm not defending the fans because uh, you know, fans fans like that should be kicked out. At the same time. You know, you, anyone who's who's gotten to that point in in the NBA or you know even WWE, but anyway, you know, we, hey, in, in WWE we have seen situations where guys have said the wrong thing. I mean, um, and um, or even to put their hands on a guy, and and you know Eddie Guerrero, just for example, in in Europe. I mean, people know that story. Or um, there was another one with Eddie Guerrero. I think I think it was in Winnipeg. Um, guys do lose sight of stuff when they have hot tempers, and it's not the right thing to do. You 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 can't win that way, and it, and you're asking for trouble. Yeah, I, it's just uh, the reason why I bring it up is because uh, as soon as that happened, uh, uh, you know, on SI, that some of the columnists started again. Well, here we've got WWE behavior going into the sports again, and I just think it's we're going to go through another thing that's <laughs> going in this down cycle right now. It seems like. Well, I don't think this is going to hurt professional wrestling any. Although, I mean, I know people. I've, I've heard people. Uh, there was a newscast last night that I saw where they tried to blame it on UFC. You know, so it's like. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I don't know what that had to do with it or professional wrestling, other than, you know, there's a lot of violence on TV. Uh, but, right. but this is far, you know, just do. Uh, 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 my other question was, uh, how long is the Bradshaw push going to keep on going? Indefinitely. I, yeah, that's what I'm looking at. I'm just, well, I mean, look at look at look at like the WrestleMania because look at look at it this way. way. Look at this. Way. If they do not switch a heel over from the Raw side to the SmackDown side, or they do not sign a new heel. You really, when you look at that roster on the heel side, you've got, you know, unless they turn somebody, you've got Kurt Angle, who is very questionable physically right now. He's far worse off than anyone knows. And, and John Layfield. And that's it. And, he, you know, they can't afford not to push him at this point just because of the numbers unless they, they turn somebody, which they, they need to do, or move somebody over, which they need to do even worse. See, I, I, I've never understood why Booker T was not given the, the top heel position when he was brought over to SmackDown. They were enamored with this J.R. Ewing thing, and you know, someone convinced someone that it was a brilliant idea, and because um, I don't, and they gave it, they, they gave it every chance, and and, um, and 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 they won't accept that it didn't work. I, it's just you know, and I will give people. I I, under, I understand you, Dave, like you were saying, like. He does have some skill with the mic, but I still see he's just mid card. You know, I high, high, high mid card at best. I agree. You yeah. know, it's just because I cannot see anybody buying the fact. You know, oh, there's this four way dance, and he's going to lose the belt. You know, that he, he better if he beats all three of those guys. They're real. They're in worse trouble then. 
Believe me. I mean, why would you, like you're saying, why would you give the belt to one of the baby faces? Because you could, if you keep it on him, he's got a number of people he can defend against. Yeah, but you can't you can't play that game forever. Plus, I think that the, the, the heel champion for so long, I think it's a crutch that people you know look at 1980s psychology and 1970s, and it isn't the 70s and isn't the 80s. And I think that's one of the big problems is they're looking at it, they're looking at a certain psychology that is ancient, and it's a totally different mentality of fan, and it's a totally different type of business today. And and I'm not saying that heel should never be champion or never even have a lengthy run because if you got a hot heel. Right. Who's drawing? You can't. I go by what's working and what's not working, and this is not working. And that's the that's all. This is not working. You got to try something else. Yeah. And finally, and finally, the other thing is, what's going to be once the belt is taken off of him? Where does his career go after that? Well, as I said, they they have to keep him strong. Be just just the numbers tell you they got to keep him strong. Yeah. Well, thanks for taking my call, Dave. Okay, we're going to go to uh, Brian in uh, Midland, Texas. Brian, what's going on? Hey, man. Thanks for taking my call tonight, guys. Um, I just want to make a couple comments, maybe ask you a couple questions real quickly. Um, first of all, uh, Triple H, I think, is, 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 as I think maybe someone alluded to earlier, is pretty much, I think, going to be the death of this whole thing unless somebody can step in. Now, I don't know how much backstage uh, pull he really has. Uh, he's got he's got every bit as much as everyone says. Is that right? So yeah. basically, he writes the shows around himself, and he, uh, he doesn't write the shows. Stephanie writes the shows, but it's his wife. Yeah, right. Well, I think, uh, again, that's what's going to be the death of it. I mean, I, I have to believe fans are, are sick and tired of Triple H at this point. And, and that, that's one thing I was hopeful for back when they actually had uh, uh, bought out WCW, that we finally will have one world champion. And with so many people in the mix, you'll, you won't see so much of Triple H at the top. Well, then they went and did the roster split, and that kind of killed the whole thing there. Now we're back at, you know, two world champions, who's the best, and, and this and that. But nonetheless, I just think that uh, Triple H will be uh, ultimately the death of this if he continues to have the power that he does. Uh, secondly, I want to say, tough enough, I think the whole concept of it is, is total crap. I think after three years, I saw the match the other night with uh, Maven in there. He, he missed a uh, drop kick by a mile. I mean, after three years, you would think the guy would learn something like that. He can't. I think the whole tough enough thing is crap. And if nothing else, it breeds uh, a resentment in the locker room, I would think, amongst the veterans and, and that these guys are getting a free ride. Um, um, you're, 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 right, you're right about the fact that it creates a resentment in the locker room and that... Uh... Um, there's, there's no question. There's no question about that. At the same time, um... at the same time, it's been among the most entertaining aspects of the show for the last month and a half. Yeah, I mean, and there isn't. There has been an upsurge in SmackDown ratings. I don't know that that's the reason, but I would have to think that that's that that's part of it. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm not a fan of this version of Tough Enough. I was definitely a fan of the other version. Yeah, and I think it was more. I think that other version was much more interesting and intriguing than this one. Yeah, I, I, I don't like. I don't like this version because it's a, it's it's a it's a male divas contest. Well, that, exactly. And look at what they did the, uh, a couple weeks ago to the Big Show. I mean, they had to go back and re-edit that SmackDown because they wouldn't sell or didn't sell the slams of the Big Show. Well, that was, you know, whose fault that was. That was the, you know, every one of these segments. I just say this has exposed to me uh -huh. just how little the people in the company think things through. Right. Because every one of these things, you take guys, you got to remember when they were out there in front of the big, sh the big Show thing, I think that those guys, with the exception of The Miz, every one of them had had two days of training. They had not been taught to sell. They did not know. And so, therefore, they did not. And the problem was is that I think anyone sitting there with, with any kind of thinking this through, should have been able to see that problem happen before it happened, and not done what they did. Um, you know the you know and and every week every week there's been something like that on it. Um, I thought that this this last uh, Thursday show, to me watching that thing, and Brian, I want to ask you about this one. To me, the real negative was is is you know you can see that um, they're scared of one on one one of their guys being embarrassed because of what happened with Kurt Angle. So what they did was they took two guys, who were the bottom two guys on their SmackDown roster, the Basham brothers, who it's like if they get embarrassed, oh, well, it's our bottom guys anyway. But what they did was it was like a two-on-one situation where you had one novice trying to, you know, get through not one guy but two guys. And to me, it was like, um, it was, it was like showing a ter terrible insecurity of professional wrestling. I mean, I really, I really thought from a pro wrestling standpoint that it, it just made pro wrestling look weak when we have to put... We have to put two guys out there, and we're scared to put anyone, anyone of name value out there to stop these guys. And, um, you know, watching those guys double team, and that was a total shoot, you know, double team these guys. And, and you know, you know, you know. Almost getting through. 
One of the, yeah, almost getting through, but I mean, going for submissions and spot the ass submissions when you're two on one. You know, like with damage or going for, um, it was on Dan Rodimer. Hey, and, real quick before you guys go, isn't it time for Ric Flair to retire and Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, is that going to happen in TNA? I doubt it, but I wouldn't, I, I, I you know, I, cause I don't think Hulk Hogan's going to wrestle in TNA deep down. Um, as far as Ric Flair retire, Unfortunately, I mean physically, I, I could say yes, but you know he's one of the most he's one of the most entertaining guys on the whole show. So I, I hate to say go. <laughs> okay, you're very welcome. Hey, we are going to go to Allen in Deerfield Beach, Florida. Allen, what's happening? Hey, Dave, how's it going? It's going pretty good. Great. I wanted to ask you about rumors about Hulk Hogan uh, buying TNA. Oh God, I just don't imagine that's going to happen. I thought that was kind of far fetched, but. Uh, it's true that Jerry Jarrett wants him back, but Jeff doesn't. That's, that's uh, that I don't. I don't know that Jeff doesn't, but I, I know that Jerry. I know that Jerry does. I mean, I, you know, I mean, if you look at where TNA is, from a, I mean, there's, there's, you know, you got your ups and your downs of, of Hulk Hogan. Right. But the one thing that the company needs more than anything else is visibility, and and you can bring in Randy Savage, Scott Hall, and Kevin Nash three times over, and they don't equal, in terms of mainstream visibility, one Hulk Hogan. That's the truth. Right. And so if they have a chance to get him, I would think that they would do anything they can to get him. At the same time, I don't know. You don't know You don't know what Hogan's game is, and, and Hogan is always playing a game. Yeah, and as far as Gene Snitsky and the eye injury, I mean, you know, did Maven, like, get any heat for that in the locker room, or what? Uh, I didn't hear the, you know, he did. You know, I'm, I'm sure if there was any heat, it was probably over uh, very quickly when uh, Gene Snitsky went and hurt Randy Orton the very next night, so, you know. Oh, uh, yeah, he broke his nose, right? I don't know if it's broken or not, but uh, he sure clotheslined him right across the nose. I mean, that was, that was... Clump. He quickly paid Maven back, too, in that same match. Yeah, that's true, he did. With that chair shot. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. I, I, I tell you what, you know, after the, after what happened to Kurt Angle and, and, and Chris Nowinski and some other people, Sure. I I just cannot believe they still do those kind of chair shots to the head. Yeah. yeah. Let me ask you something real quick because uh, I, I know you want to move on to the next caller. Uh, Luger did an interview for RF Video, and he said that him and Flair never had a problem. But you had said, I thought, if I'm not mistaken, that there was some sort of a grudge about that. Uh, Luger Luger's interview. Um, I, I actually saw that tape, and that tape is from from start to finish. Sure. It's pure fantasy. From start, really? I mean, there was so much on that tape. I mean, I, I, and I don't know, you know, you know. I mean, I don't know where Luger's head's at. I don't know if he doesn't remember things. But my impression was is it's Luger just was was you know doing a two hour con. And um, I mean, cause that's you know, I mean, like you know, they asked him, you know, like questions about you know the, the simplest things. Right. And he and he would like you know like, are you mad at Vince McMahon? You know what I mean? It's right. like how, you know, seriously, this man went on television, and I mean, you know, like Luger did not kill Elizabeth. He did not come close no, to killing Elizabeth. Though. Um, and Vince McMahon went and implied that he did, knowing and 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 and, and knowing full well that he didn't, because everyone knew by the time that sh that confidential aired, everyone knew the story. Right. And you know, you know, it's like I understand, you know, Vince wanting to get revenge on Lex Luger sure. for uh, walking out of him in '95. But to me, that, that's not the way to do it. That's total BS to to, yeah. to 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 make someone where he walks around. You got to remember this guy when he walks around. You know, one out of every twenty people looking at him is going like, "Oh my God!" You know, he's freaking OJ. And I think yeah. that you know, even even. I'm not a fan of Lex Luger, but he does not deserve that at all. People think that, but let me ask you. So you're saying Luger and Flair did have a problem, or you think? Oh well, I mean, I mean, as far as you know, when Flair didn't, you know, Luger held, Luger held a grudge for 11 years when when Flair didn't put him over for the title in 1990, and I mean, I you know, I, and, and that's one of the reasons why Flair had to eat, you know, what all that time in TNA because because Luger was aligned with Nash and they were the cool guys, and therefore Ric Flair became the uncool guy. And I mean, you can look at how Ric Flair was booked at the end, and look at Ric Flair today. And and that he's you know five years older and he's more and he's far more of an effective character now than he was then and and what does that tell you you know I mean it tells you that they were you know they were going out of their way to bury him and it worked so Luger was lying basically oh yes <laughs> well I think you can see maybe an intention to why he would do that thank you yeah Thanks. but I mean what's he gonna do go say oh yeah you know I held a grudge you know I held a grudge for eleven years and tried to ruin the guy's career and we tried to make it miserable that he would get the company yeah I mean you know you're not you're not gonna say that because you know even I mean you're just not gonna say that you just got you know you know what I'm saying. Okay, Alan. All right, Brian. We were going to talk to you. What, what was your thoughts exactly regarding um, regarding the way that that whole thing was set up on the Tough Enough on Thursday with the with the back? Because when I saw that, I'm just thinking like I just thought it made the company look so weak. Well, I was trying to figure out if, if they were trying to embarrass the Bashams, to be honest with you, because uh, to me they, they're not trying to embarrass their own guys. I don't. No, I don't mean like embarrass them, but let the Tough Enough guys get over on a superstar in some way, even if it's something like a, a capture the flag. Because obviously they can't do one-on-one -on -one because you'd have one guy going up against five men. 
Yeah. Because obviously every tough enough guy is going to have a chance. And even Angle in there only made it through two guys. Yeah. So uh, the two-on-one thing, the thing that I was that I was thinking was, I understand it's two-on-one and everything, but those Bashams were really having a fight to restrain these guys, and it's a fresh guy every time. And to me, it was almost like they want somebody to get through. And uh, since Peter was the last guy up... Well, if they, if they were arranging it that way, that was the, way, the guy they wanted to get through. Yeah, he was last. So I yeah. think that they wanted him to get through, and he didn't. But what can you do? Well, the Bashams didn't want him to. They were, no, they didn't. They were, they were, that's the hardest I've ever seen those guys fight in my life. Oh, yeah. I mean, they were... They had to fight because every guy that got in was ready to go. And they, you know, by the time Peter was in there, they'd gone through four guys for 30 seconds. In yeah. it's two-on-one and everything, but those guys were fighting. They were fighting with everything. They were fighting. I think in their minds they were fighting for their jobs because they, hey, 12 guys just got cut. Yeah. And they know that they're, you know, like between, you know, 13 and 16 on, the, on that list, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, Mike, you should see that. It's quite, quite interesting. Yeah, my presumption was that it was guys that are, let's face it, on the bubble. And, uh, you know, I think WWE knew full well, you know, what they were doing, putting those guys out there in that position. Um, yeah, I haven't seen it yet, but... Uh, I think also just the fact, like you said, that that, that it had to be two on one. You know, what what does that say about the the current roster? Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, I thought it made the you know the company you know whatever. To be honest, after watching everything they've done on Raw for the last uh, five weeks now, <laughs> I didn't even think twice about the two on one. I really didn't. Yeah. Well, how about the three on one in Armageddon? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. There you go. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we will go to uh, Jeffrey in uh, New York City. Jeff, what's going on? Hey, what's going on, guys? Not too much. I got a I got a question for you. Um, yeah, actually, all three of you. Um, someone alluded to the incident that happened this past Friday, uh, two days ago. And there was also an incident yesterday on a football game. Uh, having said that, uh, and considering the times that we have we have now, where the stuff they did in wrestling 50 years ago, with wrestlers have to go through the crowd just to get in their cars, you know, situations like that can't happen. Um, has guys like Vince. And Jerry, Jared, are they going to do anything to ensure that something like this doesn't happen at, at wrestling events? Um, I, I, I'm sure that the guys may, you know, are probably, you know, I don't know if they, they even need to tell the guys. I think the guys all know, you know, you don't go in the crowd. And I mean, at, as far you as you think so, do you really think so? Well, you ought to tell them. All those pay per views with Kid Cash in Nashville. That's true. You're right. You're right. Well, the one thing about Orlando is 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 that atmosphere doesn't of, of any wrestling atmosphere there is that one doesn't lend itself to um, um, guys going in the crowd as much. Yeah, that's that's for sure, especially because of the crowd mix. Number one, and and also because of the separation too of the majority of the crowd. Not that there isn't that pit area and, and the opposite side front row seats that are actually pretty close to the ring, but uh, the majority of the people are kind of elevated up and away from it. So uh, I think in, in terms of security, uh, I can't you know I can't really imagine that they would be adding extra security for the for the TNA uh, tapings this week. But uh, I know that uh, the NBA is is certainly going to do it if if nothing else then. Uh, as uh, you know, as, as a measure to try and get over with the with the public. Mm. Yeah, I can see that too. Um, my other question had to involve involves. Uh, I was reading an interview online with the Bashams, and they basically said the same thing over and over again about about the tough enough contestants that they don't respect them because of the sacrifices that they've made. That, well, those, those hey, you know, those two guys. You know, let's face it. They, they they sat there in OVW for about you know a year and a half to two years after being ready because the uh, writing team you know didn't you know they you know they they, they they you know I can see their point of view as far as seeing you know they, they, and it didn't just tough enough but but guys came through OVW you know that were preliminary guys in OVW and they were main event guys and they would get call up ahead of them and call up ahead of them and, and you know especially you know Doug who was you know a really good wrestler. For a long time, and you know, you can't help but have that resentment. I'm sure Dinsmore has it, even though Dinsmore's kind of getting, you know, some, something of a star now. Of seeing, we used to, you know, Brian and I joked about it forever about Dinsmore. You know, I mean, you know, they would get bring in like, you know, Mark Jindrak and Mark Henry and all these guys that were nothing in OVW, and they would bring them in, give them a push because they're big guys or because they have nice bodies, and uh, those guys would sit there in OVW, and and I, I'm, I wonder. As far as those two guys go, I mean, aside from the money thing, 
Okay, because the, obviously the money's much better. But if you took away the money, I would be willing to bet they were much happier where they were. What, what, what do you think, Brian, on that I, one? I guarantee they were much happier. <laughs> I guarantee. I would bet it a significant amount of money. Yeah, because, I mean, I know, you know, like, every time, you know, the, when, when Doug Basham went back, the last time they were on TV, uh, remember that six-man tag they had? It was, I don't so know. So happy. He looked, so, I was going to say, fire. He looks, I, I've never seen a wrestler look is so happy, and he never looks happy. And, boy, I'll tell you what, watching that show on that Thursday, those guys were mad. I mean, they were, they were really mad. Yeah. Um, Jeff, anything else on, on that? Yeah, just, just a really quick comment about it. No, I find, I take an exception to that because you got a guy like Daniel Pew, uh, Jr., he's, he's been in MMA for six or seven years. Is that like he didn't get beat up, too? So I, oh, I he, got be, he got beat up by the best of them, too. I know that. That's kind of disrespectful to, to say that, you know, a, a, he's a tough enough contestant. You know, I think it's kind of disrespectful. Like, for, for, for that one, but, but uh, for Mike the Miz, I don't know. Hmm. You know? Okay. Okay. Although, right. my, you, know, I shouldn't even, you know what? I shouldn't even say that about Mike the Miz because Mike the Miz has been doing pro wrestling for two years and, uh, you know, at UPW. Um, so I shouldn't even say that about him. That's really unfair, too. Mike, before you go... Uh, it's only two weeks from today where you have your second three-hour pay-per-view from Orlando, uh, with, including Randy Savage's first match in, God, I think it's like four years, uh, over four years. Um, why don't you run down a little bit about what's going to be on the card? Sure. December 5 is the Turning Point pay-per-view. Main event is a six-man tag team match with the return to the ring of Randy Savage, teaming with AJ Styles and Jeff Hardy against the self-proclaimed kings of wrestling, Jeff Jarrett, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. It's going to be a six sides of steel cage match with Triple X against America's Most Wanted. Uh, really looking forward to that one. And the losing team there is going to have to disband. And then the other matchup that I really have my sights set on is the X Division title bout with Petey Williams defending against Chris Saban. And I just think that the, the thread and the storyline that, uh, that follows that matchup with, with Williams and, and Saban both having trained together and and Saban having the the counter for the Canadian Destroyer uh, devastating finishing move of Petey Williams uh, is, is one of my favorite stories uh, right now in TNA. And I want to remind everybody as well that it's Impact every Friday at 3 o'clock on uh, FSN on Fox Sports Net. What was it like working with the Best Damn Sports Show crew? Uh, I was really pleased. I was very happy with uh, the professionalism of everybody involved. Uh, definitely Brian Cox was a huge wrestling fan. Uh, John Sally, very friendly as well. Tom Arnold definitely got into it, and I think you could tell uh, from the way that Tom Arnold was was really putting over the TNA wrestlers how much they enjoyed being there. And I think you really got a sense of it if you watched a couple of shows leading up to our two shows, as well as the shows after. Uh, just to how, how many times that they referred back and 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 previewed the shows, you could really tell that they were into it. Well, that's really good. Um, of course, that's as, as you mentioned. Um TNA Impact at 3 p.m. every Friday on Fox Sportsnet, and of course the pay per view turning point in two weeks. Mike, thanks very much. Brian, you know, real quick, what were your thoughts as far as um, coming out of Survivor Series or and, and 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 all that watching the show? I missed half that. I got cut off. Oh, what were your thoughts on Survivor Series? Uh, I thought the first two matches were good. I thought the main event was good. I thought the uh, middle of the show was uh, pretty bad. Um, Heidenreich and Undertaker. We were all making bets, and I think they went about five times or six times as long as I predicted. And uh, mm -hmm. it was better than I expected it to be, but it was still horrible. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I was just, you know, it was just a show. It was way below the standards of what you'd expect from, like, a, a big four show. But okay. I, don't, I don't think people had high expectations for this one. They didn't, but it's still Survivor Series, and you should give them something. Yeah, well, I know, I know. But, I mean, when you looked at the lineup... You know, I mean, you, you, you had a lineup that were nothing, you know, nothing in the lineup jumped at you like, wow, this is, I can't wait to see this match. Yeah, but that's every pay-per-view that they've done for as long as I can remember. Yeah, that's true. By the way, I finally saw the Ben 1 DVD. Oh, did you? Oh, it's, it's great. <laughs> it's great. Yes, it is. I have not, um, what was it, I, I, I haven't seen the ECW one. And he, you know you can't get it here? I don't think you can get it in a lot of places, actually. Yeah, it just sold out. I, I mean, they did, uh, that's real interesting. I mean, I... I would take advantage of it. I mean, to me, it's like it's another sign from God. Sure. That means they're not going to. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, think that, I think that God is a wrestling fan. <laughs> because he, you know, I think that what's, what's, what's even the most amazing is that um, 
you know how Tuesday's the, the investors conference and everything, you know, every number, you know, the ratings have been terrible, the house shows have been terrible, the pay per views have been, you know, record lows. And then the week before the investors conference, all of a sudden, you know, Rod is its best number in five months and SmackDown is its best number in a year for yeah. no for no reason. No good reason. I don't even know why. The DVD goes crazy. The ECW DVD, yeah, that's right. Well, but that one, I that one. I can't say that I expected it to go as crazy as it did, but I'm I'm not shocked either. You know, I mean, I I, I could have seen that as a possibility. Yeah. Brian. Yep. What do you uh, What do you think of Michelle McCool being back on uh, Thursday night? Um, along with the other women. You know, uh, I mean, they brought three of them back all in the same week. I can't believe it. I, I you really can't believe it. And not, that they, not that they brought them back, that they brought them back in the same week. It's to me, it's like it's like saying like, I mean. If you do, if you do like one every month or so, you get a chance to kind of focus on them coming in. But when you have three of them and they all come in the same week, you don't focus on any of them. So therefore, none of them are going to get over. Well, to me, that wasn't the main problem because I don't see any of them getting over anyway. <laughs> uh, to me, the problem was bringing uh, three of them back on a show where you're doing a voting deal for Tough Enough, because all it did was prove that this entire deal is a scam. Uh, every tough enough guy that gets cut, unless there's absolutely zero long-term hope, is going to get a contract. Well, of the guys that are left, I would almost be sure that everyone left is getting a, is getting a, is getting a developmental contract that, that doesn't get the big prize. Yeah, and uh, they, they were just telling everybody that uh, all this effort you put into voting for these girls uh, really meant nothing because all you were voting for was which one was going to be on TV for a year and get the most money. And it's the same thing for Tough Enough. All this voting is doing is deciding which guy is going to be on TV first and get the most money. Uh, the rest of it's all a scam. Everyone's getting a job. Everyone's getting a contract. Uh, so why vote? That's you know, what told me. Um, an- another thing about that is the interesting thing is that the woman who theoretically, um, and, and actually I should say, on the, the, the Tough Enough, you know, like, you know, one of the things about between the, the difference between the Tough Enough and the Diva Search is that on the Diva Search, you had to vote by phone. And there was an independent company. Now, I'm not saying that everything was on the up and up, but I believe it was. Um, but, um, well, I, I, up and up. Um, okay, I take that back. I, I, I know too much. Okay. Um, but <laughs> but the, the point is is that there was an independent company doing this, whereas the this one coming in, there is no independent verification. It's just you know based on what WWE wants. I'm not saying that they're going to cheat on it um, or they're not going to cheat on it. You know, I mean, but... I'm just saying that it's not an independent company. But the one who took second, which was Carmella, is interestingly one of only two of the ten finalists that we have not seen on television in the last week, even though she did get that extra couple of weeks to do the feud with, with um, Christy. And, I mean, the funny part of that was is that, you know, she legitimately did rub a lot of people the wrong way, um, even though the crowd, in a sense, if you go by um, the crowd, I, I don't say they picked her to win, but they picked her to be top heel for sure, Yeah, the top antagonist. And, um, you know, it's, it's again, them kind of, um, I don't know, just kind of overruling. Uh, well, it's not really overruling because, you know, it's just, it's just interesting to me. Um, but, yeah, you're right. That was another part of it. It was is by bringing all of them back before the Tough Enough is over, it's kind of telling everyone that, you know, you know, who wins, yeah, gets a prize, but it's not, you know, it's not like if you lose, you're going home and you don't have a prayer. Yeah. Uh, let's go, but before we do, um, Hoist Naki Bono. <laughs> Who do you think Yay! Who do you think a total freak show. Uh, I was I was happy to see Akebono in such phenomenal shape at under 500 pounds, but uh, you know, weighs a guy by 300 pounds. I don't think it means really anything. Uh, but anything can happen in a fight, so I guess we'll see. Uh, he's still losing. Yeah. Um, no stamina at 465. You'd think not. <laughs> I would think not. Well, he gassed quicker than Sap. Then again. Um, then again, a trained Bob Sapp, I think, would beat Hoist. I think would kill Hoist. Oh, if he were trained, for sure, because he almost killed Noguera. Yeah, exactly, who's bigger t- bigger and much tougher. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, he could sit on him. He could. He could fall on him. He could fall on him and break Hoist's ribs. I mean, anything's possible in a fight. But uh, I'm not counting on that happening. No, I'm counting on him, like, standing there, Hoist running away, him getting tireder and tireder, and then all of a sudden him just... Falling down and <laughs> getting choked. I see the fans being extraordinarily into it, though. Maybe not as much as if it were someone who actually played to the crowd a lot, like Sakuraba. But uh, there's just—it's going to be so freaky. This little 180-pound man and with this 470-pound man that it just can't 
help but be... Oh, it's going to be intriguing looking, just like, you know, Giant Silva with um, Segura and... Um... This will look far stranger than that. Yeah. Yeah, but I saw, um, was it Butterbean and Genki Sudo? Which was, yeah, which was great. Yeah, for what it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, Genki Sudo is a lot more entertaining than Hoist Gracie, though. That's true. And Butterbean, um, <laughs> Butterbean, if nothing else... He's more colorful than Aki Bono. Yes. There's something about, I mean, I think Butterbean's kind of a colorful character. Yeah, he is. Anyway, we will start. We're going to go to um, Steve in Las Vegas. Steve, what's going on? Hello, Dave. How you doing? It's doing good. Okay. Uh, in regards to that uh, uh, Kurt Angle uh, Peter deal. Yes. Uh, WF, WWF and Kurt Angle got exactly what they uh, they got exactly what they deserved. Because I think you one mean, unwritten you, you, law. You mean you mean you mean, you mean you mean you mean stupid people deserve to have things happen to them? Oh, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I actually believe so too. Because here's the thing: two professionals. I mean, we've even had uh, a conversation with old time fans. Hey, I wonder who the real shooter is behind closed doors, uh, Lou Fez or whoever. And I told them this: that's between them. The one per. I mean, when they're in like professional or whatever. But as far as who's better or something like that, they might practice on each other uh, behind closed doors and stuff, but you don't show up somebody else. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, like I went to that Las Vegas convention, and uh, uh, we were doing uh, the, the seminar there, the, the, rest, the pro wrestling seminar, which I knew zero about. Uh, and in between, in between sessions, I was uh, doing some jujitsu with one guy who was, Okay, he was physically stronger than I was, but I think I was a little bit better. And I went for it, but he stopped me. Now, I found out two hours later that that was uh, Kenny from Tough Enough. Kenny King. I known it was Kenny from Tough Enough? Not that I needed to, because obviously I didn't need to. I would have eased up. I wouldn't have went for the kill, because I didn't want to make him look bad. Now, what Kurt Angle and WWF did, they tried to punk all these new guys. And so they got what they deserved. Well, I, I don't blame Kurt. Kurt was put in a bad position. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, Kurt was following orders. He was put in a bad position. And the, the other people, um, I mean, they wanted to, they, they, you know, it was a bully situation. And, you know, bullies, you know, you know think and they didn't think. You know, they, they, didn't, they didn't recognize, you know, they didn't, they didn't recognize what this guy was. I mean, that's the bottom line. They, they thought, you know, oh, some guy, you know, he... He trained in some dojo. Maybe even had he even had one one shoot fight, but he's not Kurt Angle. And I mean, they don't realize, you know, this guy, this guy's the real, you know, this guy trained with some good people, and he can beat some people. And you know, just because he, it doesn't show up in his record because he has not done professional fighting, I mean, I know because you know he's he's a San Jose guy. Um, I mean, he, you know, Shinsuke Nakamura, who's one of New Japan's biggest stars. I mean, he thrashed that guy, and then that guy's a national caliber wrestler. And you know, Kurt's. You know, Kurt's old and he's hurt, and I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that if Kurt got himself in the best shape and learned the game, the new game, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, I mean, I don't know. But the point is, is that they went in there blinded and, and not even understanding, not even understanding what the game is today, and they got, you know, that's what happened. And 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 then, what the funniest part of the whole thing was is that it could have been the greatest thing that ever happened to him because that's the funny part of. Of um, when you get surprised, you know the, the 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 one person I remember this from the '80s, you know, because because when, when things happened to Vince McMahon, he would always go, "You turn negative into a positive," and 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 I thought, you know what? When it comes to pro wrestling, sometimes things happen to you. You, everyone thinks Vince can control the whole world, and he can't. No one can control the whole world. Things get thrown at you. Who even knows what they're going to be? But you tur- you you know, and you can't always turn negative into a positive. But in this case. Turning a negative into a positive was so easy, and they were so stubborn that they wouldn't do it. It's almost yeah. like when you're actually doing a match, and uh, sometimes you have a plan or everything like that, and something goes awry. And uh, if you watch the really great wrestlers, they just go with it, and they make the most of it. And it's strange that this isn't, isn't, reality is completely different. Isn't that what working is, though? Yes. I mean, to me, working isn't, isn't, isn't going out there and playing in the dressing room move for move. It's like when... An opportunity arises in a match. Something happens. You instinctively know. I mean, no one, you know, Ric Flair, instinctively, if, if there's an opportunity, whether a fan says something or a guy misses a spot, you know, and lands on his knee, I mean, he instinctively didn't go, well, golly, the story of my match is to do a side headlock now. It's just like, you know, I'm going to start kicking his leg. Yeah. You know, and, and no one has to tell you that's what a good worker does. Yep. 
I mean, when Bruno San Martino got his neck broken, they, I mean, they, it made Stan Hansen a star. He didn't want to break his neck. Uh, you know, no one wanted uh, uh, his neck broken, but, you know, Stan Hansen became a star. Am I correct on that? I mean, Stan I mean, Hansen became a superstar because he dropped Bruno on his head, and, 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 and they credited it to the Lariat. And the Lariat for Stan Hansen, not just, you know, first in the U.S. and then later in Japan, you know, just a frickin' clothesline became, you know, one of the great finishing moves of the next, what, 10, 15 years. So, yes, and, and that, was, that was the match that did it. He, he, was, he was made by, by the fact that he accidentally dropped Bruno San Martino on his head, something that I'm sure he wished he'd never done, and, but it made him a superstar doing it. Yeah, but, uh, but going back to the one other aspect of you just don't show the people up, and I don't know what the thinking of they're making all these new... If he punked everyone in that crew... Then the guy who made it is like everyone remembers. He got punked. Um. Yeah. 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 Half the people. Th half, the, half the people think he did anyway. That don't know. Way more than half. Yeah, you're Way right. I, I would say I would say ninety percent, and maybe even ninety five percent. And you know, and I'll just throw one one more thing at you. Uh, I was uh, training at John Lewis' school, and I'm not going to mention names or or whoever. Like, uh, but. There's one guy who doesn't fight a lot, but everyone knows he's the real deal. But he doesn't get the more kind of money he he wants. But he trains with a lot of the top level guys, uh, you know, uh, Tito, uh, Iceman, Couture level guys. Okay, that's all I'm gonna say. And someone said, "Oh, you train with him?" And he said to him, "Do you knock him out?" And the guy says, "Look, you don't ask that. You don't ask that. It's it's not. You know what I'm saying? It's an unprofessional type thing." Yeah. You know, oh, you can, oh, sure. You know, all of a sudden you get a lot of, uh, you know, uh, shoe talk in here between guys, and all of a sudden there's a lot of bad feelings. Because, oh, yeah, I beat them all the time. Or, I mean, you just can't have that. And especially in the pro ranks when, well, I guess winning and losing doesn't matter as much, but, you know. Yeah, uh, we're going to go to Patrick, who uh, I'm presuming went to a house show in Kingston, Ontario yesterday. Is that true? Yes, that is true. And thank you very much for posting my uh, report on your website. Well, thank you very much for sending it. No problem. Uh, by the way, about Randy Orton's nose, uh, it's perfectly fine. There's nothing, no scratches or anything on his nose at the house show. Okay, so it wasn't broken then. No, it was just probably just a, uh, a bloody nose. That's about it. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, the house show was pretty good, and um, I'm liking the fact that uh, the WWE is going to, uh, like, smaller towns like Kingston, who have a population less than 200,000 people in their own city, and... Uh, I'm glad that the WWE is thinking about the smaller towns because they have no it. choice. <laughs> oh, okay. they're, they're 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 cheap. They're cheaper to run, and uh, they can they they don't drop appreciably less than the bigger cities now. Oh, jeez! I wonder why NWTNA is not coming up to Canada at all. Oh boy! Oh, that's too expensive to uh, lose that kind of money to go up there. Oh, <laughs> bad uh, economy rate, eh, I guess? <laughs> no, just they can't draw. I mean, they can't draw for free. They're not going to be able to draw for paying up in Canada. Oh, just like a good old WCW with their free tickets, eh? Uh, every, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the WWE house show was good. Um, they didn't have Christian's uh, new uh, uh, jacket, you know, the one that they had a Survivor Series on Monday Night Raw. Uh -huh. He didn't come out to his new music. He didn't come out to his... Uh, with his coat on, he didn't even come out with Tom coat. They, but they sort of made the um, interference at the end, like almost like the Survivor Series type. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, all the matches were great, and I'm glad that the WWE product is getting a little bit better. But hopefully, they'll be able uh, to get the fans into this more often. Yeah, um, they need new they need, they need new faces. That's the best. Oh, the, the, that's yeah. the main thing, really. New, yeah. new fresh faces, and there's. Uh, and they need to be able to sell them, sell the people on the new fresh faces. There, there are some people in OBW now that are, that are, you know, I've, I've noticed some real improvements in uh, Johnny Nitro and uh, Johnny Nitro, Matt Apatelli. Uh, who else have I seen? Um, Chris Masters has really improved, but they're going to bring him up too fast. I can already, I know that for a fact. Would you think a uh, Raw and SmackDown uh, uh, roster ending uh, would uh, propel the WWE back? to like it was a few years ago. Like no, 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 no. I've seen stuff like that happen in other forms of similar entertainment where you have split crews and then you put them back together. And there's a, a, a short period of time where when they're put back together, you get a little bit of an increase, but then it goes back to where it was. So it would be a um, short-term boost. I'm not even like... Um, 
I'm not necessarily even in favor of ending it. Ending the brand split, but I am in favor of ending the brand split when it comes to pay-per-views because I just think that the singular brand pay-per-views people are learning to skip, and they're and also even more than that, they haven't been very good shows. If they were really good shows, um, I think that people would buy them month after month. But I think people know that you know they haven't been all that good, and um, um, I would certainly um, have guys switch rosters as well because I just think that you know the they've gone too long with a pat hand and um, they've gone through every. Markable matchup on both sides practically, and there's nothing new. And um, I mean, name a match for um, Royal Rumble for Hunter. I mean, what you know, you've got what Chris Jericho. I mean, who they haven't even pushed. Um, you know, they're just going to save Randy Orton. It won't be him. They can go back to Chris Benoit. You know, being you know, maybe they'll do Shawn Michaels for the 94th time. I don't know, but it's it's not. They've got nothing new, is my point. Yeah, and I was uh, thinking about this. Speaking of Shawn Michaels, for the scenario for the last week of. Uh, the face is controlling Raw. I was thinking, like, Orton would surprise Triple H with a returning Shawn Michaels, but I wonder if Shawn Michaels is out for a good length of period of time right now. Uh, I heard two months, so he, he almost might be ready to come back. Mm-hmm. I mean, if they, if they wait for the fourth week, um, they wait for the fourth week, uh, touch and go. I mean, I, don't, I haven't heard anything new on Shawn, but, but, I mean, it was, it was um, arthroscopic. It wasn't reconstructive, so okay. he, he could be back in a couple months. Yeah. And um, so far, Raw's been doing okay. It's better than SmackDown has there in the last couple of months, but SmackDown's come in picking up the pieces, so to speak. Yeah, well, SmackDown had a real good number on Thursday, and I have no idea why. <laughs> but it did. What? Carlito. You think so? Well, every show they've done that's uh, heavily built around him has done a good number. Yeah, but uh, the number declined during Carlito's segment. You know, and I, I actually was thinking that, too, because... Cause, um, you know, the turnaround of the SmackDown ratings does um, coincide with um, Carlito um, getting this big push. Mm-hmm. You know, so, um, and what are you saying? New fresh character. Yeah. And it's really too bad he got hurt because he was, uh, you know, him and Cena had, have, do have something going. And unfortunately, we're not going to see either of them for, for a couple weeks again. Yeah, and hopefully JBL will lose. Thank God Jesus is there. <laughs> I hope you're being sarcastic. I am. God. Can you believe? That, that, that's like another, you know, thing like they never watch OVW. Did you, you watched the one Jesus match in OVW, didn't you, Brian? Actually, you know what? I haven't watched it yet. And to be honest with you, it took me forever to figure out that Jesus was the same horrible guy I was watching in Ohio Valley. Yeah, I mean, he's just like, like he's only done, he did one match in OVW before they called him up. And I mean, when I watched it, you know, I've watched Aaron Aguilera for years and years because he's wrestled here. And I've never, I mean, he's tall and that's the only thing I think they must see in him because and he's, and I guess because he's nice looking. But I mean, to me, I I never saw the charisma in him. Um, I never saw the work in him. And then I saw him in OVW, and it was just like, wow, he's not even he's not ready for OVW. And then, you know, I see him in OVW uh, one week, he's not ready for OVW. And the next thing I do, there he is on SmackDown. Yep. <laughs> and, and I'm not even surprised. That's the worst part of it. Hopefully, JBL will lose his uh, heavyweight title soon. Geez, that's been a long reign for him, and I'm starting to get really ticked off. Hopefully, the uh, like Booker T's, the Eddie Guerrero's, and some other entertaining person other than him having the WWE title. Yeah, um, won't make a huge difference either way, but I do think that it's time. Um, it certainly has not been a successful run, but uh, you know, <laughs> shows what happens. Vince, Vince had to, Vince had to prove something, you know. I, I think by making him champion, and I'm not sure exactly what he proved, but hopefully he's Done proving it by now. But kisser probably. <laughs> no, it's not that. It's not that. It's uh. <laughs> just, just kidding. <laughs> He's mad at Alex Marvez. So anyway. <laughs> anyway, if you have a guys, have a good night and uh, watch Raw tomorrow night. It'll be interesting. Okay. Yeah, it may very well be. Yeah. Oh, All right. Okay, All right, we're going to go to uh, Brian in Massachusetts. Brian, what's going on? Hey, Dave and Brian, how are you fellas doing tonight? We're doing really good. Hey, I'm a first-time caller. I've been listening to your program for about five or six months. I'm a road truck driver, so it's about the only way I get wrestling news out on the Internet. Oh, okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, my question was, what was your thoughts on the ECW DVD that just came out? I haven't seen it. I've been trying to get it. It's all sold out everywhere, so it's a, it's a hot seller. I have heard nothing bad about it, and this is from people who've seen it that would be naturally very critical. And I know Mick Foley was on the show, or I'm not sure if he said it on the show or he said it to me at some, another point, but he watched it and he said it was historically accurate, which is more than I can say about a lot of uh, WWE productions. But I think that the uh, ECW people and Paul Heyman had a lot to do with it and, and made sure that um, that they were not buried, which they, they could have been because if you watch the Monday Night Wars thing, um, you know, they sure... Even though Eric, Eric, on the Monday Night Wars thing, Eric Bischoff actually came off tremendous. But um, 
um, you know, they still, you know, like, were, were critical of WCW when they did the same thing that WWF, you know, did when they made their big expansion leap. But have you seen the DVD? I, uh, I, I got it on Monday, and it's totally awesome. The one disc, the whole documentary about ECW is almost three hours long. Mm-hmm. And uh, Bischoff is on it, and he comes across like a crybaby saying that he didn't steal ECW wrestlers and this, that, and the other. Well, it's I don't know if stealing wrestlers is the word. I mean, he was trying to help his own company, and um, you know, bull bullies, whether they're WWE or, or WCW, um, are naturally trying to pick on the small guy. And then when ECW got a cult following, I think they, I think both sides liked the idea of bringing ECW guys and then burying them just to prove that the ECW guys weren't good enough. And it's not the first time that's happened. But I think that um, you know, I mean, you saw with both sides. You know, they they bring in guys who were stars from ECW. Um, and we're actually getting, and more important, we're getting over with the audience. And I actually I saw it more in WWE with Taz, because that's the one that, you know, I always point to, is that he was getting over with the audience. And I know Taz's limitations as a wrestler, and he's short, and it's a big man's territory and all that. But the people bought him because Paul did an incredible job of selling the idea that this was a real badass in real life. And, the, and WWE still wanted to bury him just because, you know, whatever. They just wanted to, and they did. Well, uh, towards the end of the DVD, you kind of get the hint that it might come back. Uh, based on uh, the sales of the DVD and the, the fact that uh, <laughs> WWE doesn't have anything interesting going on, if it was me, I would bring it back. I think the timing, this is the time to do it. You know, the time, better time would have been in 2002, but what the heck. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I would do it. Well, they did sort of, but... Yo, know, that's what I... That, that, well, the, 2001 was not the time. 2001 was a year too early. Uh, 2002 was the time after they... Uh, Went through nine, you know, uh, I mean, a year and a half of the the, re, the, the real invasion, yeah. and the invasion got stale, and then you bring an ECW. Yeah. Well, oh, they had years of booking that they just flushed down the right. toilet. I in know. A, Eight I know. months it took to go through all that. Yeah. So, but 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 uh, yeah, they get another chance, and they'll screw it up again. I have a feeling. But anyway, Brian, anything else? Uh, that's it. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay, thank you, Brian. Oh, we're gonna go to Robert in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Robert, what's happening? Hey, Dave. What's going on, man? Not too much. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Hey, I've seen that uh, Lex Luger shoot interview also. Yeah. And, hey, anybody that tells you that they never had a problem working under Ole Anderson, uh -huh. they got to be lying. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who... I'll tell you another hint. When when uh, the, um, what is it, the um, air conditioner is turned up full blast and you're sweating like crazy going, it's hot in here, that's a sign of a problem. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. Yeah, um, I got a couple questions, uh, new and old. Um, with the with the way the wrestling is going today, like they're trying to make it like these guys are so legitimate, like with the dress codes and their real names and all all kinds of things. The like dress that. codes, I know. Talk about talk about like a silly response to everything that's going on. Do you think that it's time to go back to more character based wrestling? Now I'm not talking about like T. L. Hopper or. Anything like that. I didn't think you were. <laughs> I would consider, like, Stone Cold Steve Austin, I would consider him a character. Oh, I, I think that they absolutely need to get more characters and have, and have guys with different looks and things like that. I think one of the problems with the wrestling is is that everyone is wrestling, or, or too many of the guys wrestle the same, look the same, have the same haircuts, or you have the bald guys with the tattoos, and they all blend together. The whole thing about wrestling is differentiation and um, uniqueness of character and I don't think we have a lot of it, and I think that's one of, that's one of the problems with with the current with the current situation. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of weird that they 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 let this guy go, but it seems like a lot of their guys that they have are like a model built from test. Um, yeah, I know what you're saying, and that's what and they, what who was fired? Yeah, who yeah, who she just mentioned, but then but that's the other thing, and I think that the whole idea of them blindly looking for more people exactly like the people that they have that aren't working. Um, I mean, not that, you know, I mean, and, and actually, we're, you know, the people that are, aren't working even more than the people who are, if you look at the guy, at the, at the effective characters at some point over the last year, and there haven't been many, um, Triple H at times has been effective, Randy Orton certainly is a heel, and, and now as a babyface also is effective, Edge is just starting to be effective, okay, so I grant you that, but the other ones that were really effective in the last year were Kurt Angle at different times, Eddie Guerrero, and Chris Benoit the first six months of the year, and, you know, based on what they want uh, people to look like, none of those guys even make the cut. And that's insane, okay? It's just it's nothing short of insane. Right. 
you know, the irony of all this is uh, that the more legitimate he tries to make these guys out to be, um, look at your, like, like trying to make them legitimate like professional athletes. The professional athletes are acting like wrestlers up in the stand. <laughs> well, that, and he's that, trying to legitimize them like these, these guys. You know what's funny is is, is that the, the wrestling used to be um, the outrageous stuff, and now, I, I don't know, it, it, you know, I, I think that they've, you know, there's there's been... The, 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 I can't say it's been normalized because then they do those, the crazy stuff that they do, but the crazy stuff they do is just ineffective, desperate crazy, like the thing with May Young, you know, last week, which was just, you know, it was just stupid, and the people live hated it, you know? Yeah. Uh, the last guy talked about ECW coming back. Mm-hmm. Um, in my opinion, I don't think it would work under the WWF umbrella. Well, if you're expecting the ECW that was once... It can't work now because ECW, part of it was timing, and there were a whole bunch of things like Sabu with the breaking tables and stuff that they were doing in Japan with the barbed wire, and the fact that you had a younger, not that he was young, but a younger Terry Funk and a younger Mick Foley, and then you had Chris Benoit and Eddie Guerrero who were wrestling in Japan that were just incredible talents, and not just them, you know, Too Cold Scorpio and others, that people... For whatever reason, the the establishment thought were too small, and then you had the Rey Mysterio, and then there were other characters that Paul was able to, you know, Paul was real creative about making um, that were not stale. Um, to recreate it now, it would have to be a watered down version because you can't, like, you can't power bomb guys through flaming tables, and you can't have fans throwing chairs into the ring. It just wouldn't work in the WWF scheme. And the timing isn't right because there aren't all these undiscovered talents running around um, that, uh, um, you know what I'm saying? It, 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 nevertheless, as... It would have to be done to make it even remotely right. Yeah. Uh, there'd have to be different rings. There'd have to be a different look, different production. Oh, no, no, no. To me, a, a separate ECW, a separate ECW brand would not work. An ECW group feuding with WWE with a hot feud with Paulie saying, you know, we've been all been held back. I think as a program like a WCW versus NWO program, I think it would be more interesting than anything they're doing. But ECW as a separate brand, um, like with, with their own TV show, unless because if you put it in the velocity slot, which would be like the slot you'd think of, it's like no one's going to watch it anyway. You know, and it's going to end up like TNA, so that's not... I don't necessarily think that nobody is going to watch it in that slot. Um, they, I think they, they, they never they, really put anything in the slot that anybody would have any desire to ever watch. Um, they, they might they, they might watch it, but when they when it's when it's not the ECW, like like if you're you know if you're carving people's heads open, yeah, they might watch it for something different. But you're not gonna. It's not gonna happen. Yeah. And if you're just gonna have Rob Van Dam wrestle the Dudleys, you know what what difference does that make? You can see you know you've been seeing that for years and no one cares. Yeah. So. Uh, so you know, but but uh, the idea of an ECW versus WWE feud right now, just because there's nothing going on in WWE, I'm not against that if they want to do it right. I just have no faith based on their prior track record that they would do it right. As far as a separate entity, I don't think the guys are just are that hungry anymore. Um, you mean to create something as special as the, ECW was? Um, they're not. They're uh, they're they're older and they're not. You're right. You're right. I don't think any people would notice that, but that's a very good point. Um, one more question. I never knew the answer to this. But what was the the big heat between Dusty and Vince that Vince would bring him in and humiliate him and then bury him? Because I don't recall uh, Dusty ever working under Vince before. Uh, Dusty worked for the father and actually was very you know he, him, him and Superstar Graham sold out Madison Square Garden. He was always a good attraction for um, for Vince Senior. The there was a in, in from 1984 through 1988. The feud between Jim Crockett Promotions, which was booked by Dusty Rhodes, and Vince McMahon Sr., or Jr., I should say, was was very, very hot. They were on opposite sides of a promotional war, and, um, you know, Dusty was the booker. And they had, you know, their cities were, were WC, well, that wasn't WCW, Jim Crockett Promotions, had a lot of success, especially Baltimore and Philadelphia. And I think that that kind of stung Vince, who in his mind thought we were so superior to those guys down south. And then when they came into his territory, and in Baltimore especially outdrew him, I think that it's one of those things where I've got to prove that they're nothing. And Dusty represented that, and Dusty was the booker who did it, and I think that Vince, you know, had to make Dusty pay. When he had it just like he makes, just like he had a chance to do a lot more business with Eric Bischoff, and he had to make Eric pay. Well, you know, you mentioned Baltimore, I don't even, 
ever think of Baltimore as being a WWF town. Always, it, it, it historically always was until you know. But yeah, yeah. All right, all right, all right. Come on, Dave. Okay, very welcome, Robert. We will go to Bill in uh, Pennsylvania, I believe. Is it Pennsylvania? Yes. Hey, Bill, how you doing? Okay, thanks. How are you doing tonight? Doing great. Well, appreciate the opportunity to call. Uh, I'm a long time uh, subscriber. Oh, thank yeah, you very brother. much. And uh, you do a great job with that. And say hi to Brian also. Hey. Um, I was just wondering, Dave, I go back a long way, probably to the early 70s with wrestling. I used to go down to the Hamburg Fieldhouse for the WWF uh, TV tapings. And at the same time, we were lucky enough here uh, where I lived to pick up the Philadelphia and New York cable channels that brought uh, championship wrestling from Florida with Gordon Soley doing all of the announcing. And I was just wondering. You watched that stuff in the early '70s, the Gordon Soles. Yeah. Stuff? Oh, yeah, that that's was about. That's when I first got interested, really big time. Oh, I loved that stuff. And uh, that's what my question is. I guess I, I really enjoyed, you know, seeing some of the angles with, particularly Dusty was was in his prime there with promos, and um, you had Morocco reversing the figure four on uh, Jack Briscoe. Oh, I remember that. That stuff was, I, I, that was one of my favorite periods of, of wrestling was that Florida had so much talent during that, um, that would be like 1974. Because I was, I was there, I spent the summer there and went to Miami Beach every Wednesday night and there were some awesome shows and, and you know, sell out crowds legitimately every week and great angles, you know, like, uh, yeah, they, they, like, they had Don Morocco with New Jack Briscoe, which, right. you know, things like that and, Harley Race came in, and um, you know just all that talent. Yeah, Florida just had to be the greatest spot for wrestling at that point because they used to do the um, show from the with the darkened arena or the darkened background, and Gordon Sully would do highlights from just around the state from. Weekend. When they would show the clips like from Tampa and everything, every right? Week. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And uh, I was noticing in our uh, cable system this month, and I think I might have read something on your site in an interview with Mike Graham pertaining to the uh, fact that he was going to release some of the tapes from, from the early days in Florida. I was wondering, they have listed here classic wrestling uh, southern stars and classic wrestling legends revisited. And I was wondering if you knew perhaps whether any of that was footage from that time period. Uh, it could be. They did a pay-per-view, and it was excellent. Um, I'm thinking this is about a year and a half ago where um, they had, like, you know, a lot of matches from that time, not quite that time period, but around that time period, the Florida stuff with Hiro Matsuda and Eddie Graham and uh, there's Luthez, Johnny Valentine thing, but um, Jerry Briscoe and Danny Hodge, I believe. Oh, um, uh, yeah. Um, God, what else? Um, Does that bring back the memories? Yeah, yeah, um, and it was a, it was an excellent pay-per-view. Uh, some Buddy Cole, Tim, Tim Woods, Paul Jones. Um, I, I th That stuff, that I don't know what what is actually on those specific shows, but there might be stuff from that era. But I think a lot of that would be the Florida Mike Graham connect collection, and it's a good collection. I taped some of that stuff on audio cassettes off the TV at the time, and Dusty had that one promo where he brought Dickie Slater in as his protege, and uh, he came out and uh, came down with a hat, a derby hat on, and dropped the bionic elbow on Jack Briscoe, and Slater covered him. and uh, He just came out and did a great promo after that. And, I, I think it was not too long after the Dolphins had won the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. um, and he talked about that a little bit. But I was hoping that you know maybe some of that footage would make its way on with everything else in this kind of nostalgia. I don't know how much of the footage was actually saved, which is the problem. I mean, right. some of it was, but I think most of it probably wasn't. Real quick, before we get to the break, I want to mention something on on WrestlingClassics.com on one of the threads. You can click into something and hear an Ole Anderson interview, and it was the interview after he turned on Dusty Rhodes in Atlanta in 1979 or 1980. This is one of the greatest interviews in the history of wrestling. You know, I'm not necessarily a fan. Well, I'm not a fan of Ole, the person from this, from the, when he was on the show, but I will tell you that Ole, that's one of the greatest interviews I have ever seen, and, and just the audio of it. I recommend everyone listen to that interview because you will be in awe. Brian, you got to do that, by the way. Will do. Okay, we're running low on time. We're going to go to Austin, Texas, and Kelly. Kelly, what's going on? Hey, how you doing, Dave? Doing pretty good. Hey, uh, I got a. I've been a, a long time wrestling fan, and hey, hey, Brian, how you doing? Hey. <laughs> and I, you know, I hear I listen to your show now every week. I'm an over the road truck driver too, and and like I said, I, I was a wrestling fan for a long, long time, and. Now, like, when I get home, I can't even see Raw anymore. I mean, I see it for, like, five minutes and it's off. You know, it, it doesn't 
excite me, doesn't grab my attention. You know, and I, I hear this guy calling about how the WWF now or WWE is going to the smaller house shows now, like in Kingston, what he was talking about. And, you know, there was that time about 10 years ago when they were, you know, I guess the Foxwood uh, casinos in Connecticut, they would do small venues like that. Now, I know they're, they're going to start doing that again, but the problem with the WWE, I think, is, you know, they kind of bit themselves in the ass. Because with the fall of WCW and ECW, you know, they, they never really went out there and developed other talent. And, 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 and you know, when I watched, when I watched uh, SmackDown, and I, I saw it for only one reason, because of, of, of Carlito. I mean, I thought, this guy's great, man. This is what I used to love wrestling for was because of characters like this. Mm-hmm. And I'm just, do you think do you think it's going to come back to that type of format again? Do you think they're going to rebound, or do you think it, they got a, they got a tough fight ahead of them? They got a fight ahead of them because um, they, I think that they recognize the problem as far as new talent now. In fact, I know they do, but they waited about three years too long to recognize it, and now they're having to play catch up to, to do it. So, um, um, yeah, I think that's what the problem is right now. I, I just, you know, it, it's sad, like I said, I, you know, I, I'm a Northern California kid. Mm-hmm. You say you're from up around the San Jose area. Right. And, and you know, I, I just, I love entertaining wrestling. And now it, it just, it just doesn't have that anymore, you know. And I mean, I could tell you like every Tuesday, you know. Kelly, I, I, I hate to say this, but we were totally out of time. Okay. Okay. The call back next week, okay? Okay, bud. Okay, thanks very much. We're totally out of time. Thanks everyone for listening in. We'll be back next Sunday. Listen to Wrestling Observer Live on the Sport Levi Line, a radio network.